For it's that spittle in the whistle that spurs out all the tunes. It's the spittle in the whistle that makes them shake the spoons. And the best of the players, their soul comes out and trips in the rolls and the crowns and the spittle of their lips. They'll tell you that they think you're fiddle, you should tune it. They'll also let you know that humidity will ruin it. When summer comes around, you're out gigging in the heat. Keep your whistle by your side, not in the car's back seat. For it's that spittle in the whistle that spoons out all the tunes. It's the spittle in the whistle that makes them shake the spoons. And the best of the players, their soul comes out and drips in the rolls and the crowns and the Hello, I'm Jess Hayden. On behalf of the Susquehanna Folk Music Society, I'd like to welcome you to our first session of today's event, Lamentations and Laughter, the Songs of Ulster in Ireland. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Today's residency is the third in a series called Artist to Artist that pairs local artists with artists from afar for a day of mutual learning and discovery. We are grateful for funding from the National Endowment for the Arts for today's program. The Susquehanna Folk Music Society is located in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and we sponsor concerts, dances, jams, and coffee houses, and the Susquehanna Folk Festival in the summer. Learn about our events at susquehannafolk.org. Now a little housekeeping. During the program, we ask that you keep yourself on mute, and we suggested that you watch using speaker view. For those of you that are interested, captioning is available just clicking on the CC bottom at the, in the menu on the bottom of your screen. The lyrics for any songs performed today can be found on the Susquehanna Folk Music Society website. Also, today's sessions will be recorded and accessible on our website uh, through our YouTube channel. Finally, we wanted to let you know that our wonderful folklorist, Amy Skillman, who was to moderate some of the events today, is not able to be with us today. So we'll miss you very, very much, Amy. Now we have a short video for you to listen to. So Lori, take it away. Here I am amongst you and I'm here because I'm here And I'm only 12 months older than I was this time last year I am with me to Raya, with me to Raya, Raya Rise him up with me to Raya, with me to Raya, Raya <laughs> um, Hello again. That was a short clip from a local Irish music session held in Lebanon County this past August. There are similar Irish music sessions throughout our region, enough that you can attend one or two every weekend. Who knew? Local Irish singer Seamus Carmichael is largely responsible for many of them and can be found sharing traditional songs at most of them. With such great resources and interests, it seemed a natural decision to focus one of our artist to artist residencies on Irish songs. When we asked Seamus, who we would love to spend the day with, trading songs, learning from each other, and sharing tips with you all, here. <laughs> he didn't hesitate. <laughs> so today we have Maraid, Niwini, and Dahi Sabrol, both key members of the internationally known Irish group Alton, who are at the top of their list. And if you give me just a minute, I can add them to the spotlight so they are pictured here we go <laughs> and we're very lucky that they were available and uh it's great we see them now on screen so we have three remarkable artists with us today to explore the beauty and techniques of music from ulster to the north of ireland and i'm going to do my best to get seamus on also here we go. So we have our three artists right here. So <laughs> here they are. Let's bring in with some introductions. Can each of you tell us your name, 
where you grew up and where you're, where you're joining us from us today and something about how you got started playing the music that you played and about two minutes each and you can go with whatever order you want. <laughs> I'll go ladies first. Let Maria go first. Then. All right, perfect. <laughs> you're throwing me. You're throwing me into the deep end here. <laughs> <It's okay>. But <laughs> hello, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be part of today's workshop, and my name is Maureen Newini. It's very easy to pronounce my name <laughs> if you rhyme it with parade. That's like Maureen and Linguini. Uh, everyone knows what Linguini is, so Maureen Newini rhymes with parade linguini so that's how you say my name um there's other a variety of other ways to say it as well but uh, the irish language is my first language i was brought up here in northwest donegal which is the northwest western part of ireland um i would my <clears throat> both my parents are native uh, to the giltart area here in northwest donegal my father was a fiddle player teacher, primary school teacher, elementary school teacher, um, loved anything to do with creativity, writing poetry and playing tunes on the fiddle. And I had a very lovely upbringing with both of them being so interested in music and song. And really in the 60s, when I was uh, growing up, uh, there wasn't that much of an interest in Gaelic songs or anything. And um, it just that came about with the likes of, we we'll say, my partner there uh, in, in Altan, Dahi Sproul, started a band called Scarbray and we all got interested. They would have been our Beatles of of the 60s and 70s and um, made Donegal songs especially very, very vibrant and new and young and had harmonies and um, which made me then delve back into where I was from and where my music was from and especially where the songs were from, which were alive and well uh, at my front door. So that's where I got my songs from my own people and from uh, great, uh, uh, generous people like that. So that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we might as well pass it over to Dahi since he got uh, a name check there. <laughs> All right, Ruth. Um, well, I'm from uh, the county, as uh, Seamus is just adjacent to Donegal, from Der the city of Derry. And it's, you know, Derry's right on the border uh, with Donegal, and Donegal is to the north of us and it's to the west of us. So it's the border, having the border there is really very, very artificial. You know, we were the one. You know, the one area, the one place. But anyhow, um, so, I, you know, I was uh, raised um, probably not too actively involved with music, really, but uh, everybody in the house liked singing. And we, you know, we, we, we used to we were put into the face, these competitions as little children and sang some songs in Irish. But I think like a lot of people, uh, you know, when you get into your teenage years, something fires up in you uh, to do with music. So that's sort of what happened to me. So what I did, uh, what I've done with music is a combination uh, probably of several different things. And one of them would have been, um, you know, the Beatle era, because although we didn't realize it, you know, people who were musical, um, the, the Beatles, what was really interesting about the Beatles was their chords and their, their harmonies. That's really what it was about if you were gonna be a musician. And so that was intriguing. And then I started going to Ranafast very near where Mairead is from, which is this wonderful area, rich in uh, the language, the Irish language and in song and music and so on. So I began learning uh, songs, you know, in the classes there and from people, these gorgeous melodies uh, and beautiful words. And I think I was, so there was the harmony side of it, the chords, and then there's the beauty of melody, it really, excited me and then the the final thing for me really was that set me going was i didn't start playing the guitar which has become my main thing till i was 17 and in my class in derry and just a, a guy the same age as me a guy called sean o'haley he uh had this fantastic repertoire of songs in irish and in english that he had learned from his brother-in-law, Dickie McGowan, Richard McGowan, and from his friend, Johnny Gallagher, Shano Gallagher. So like just that very personal thing of that guy and the songs I got from him. And he was a brilliant guitarist. 
And so as with many, you know, artists of different sorts, there maybe is one person who just is responsible for what you do. So if I do sing at all, you know, for more than 50, 20 minutes, I'll sing something that I heard from him. So anyhow, that's the gist of what got me going. Well, uh, from my part, I, I grew up in County Derry. So we're like Donegal, Derry City, South Derry, where I come from. Mm -hmm. And um, in my community, my mother was uh, a known singer. When, what that meant was that if there was like a little parish event, like we used to have these little fundraisers called guest teas, uh, where, you know, a local housewife would, you know, make up a, uh, a meal for the community and they would put five pounds a head in and, you know, they would sit down and eat tea and sandwiches and, you know, cream buns and whatever. <laughs> and um, my mother then would always be told, Catherine, stand up and give us a song. And so I grew up hearing my mother sing all, all these songs. I mean, uh, I remember a conversation I had with her when I'm living in America and she was in a nursing home and she, she had just entered a nursing home and she was talking about uh, a song she had sung. And it's like, wait a minute, I never heard you sing that song, Ma. And it was, uh, uh, you know, a song that, you know, I, I, I've heard, uh, you know, Silly Wizard sing later on. So I, I was like, you knew that song? I was like, and, and she had a, a store of songs and I regret now not having paid more attention to the songs that she sang. But, um, I realized that this book here, Sam Henry's uh, Songs of the People, uh, had a lot of the songs. And I remember like um, the Northern Constitution was uh, a newspaper that was, you know, weekly on our, on our tables at home. And my parents would always go through it to the Songs of the People section uh, to say, oh, I know that one or, or you know, something like that. So it, it was very much part of, uh, of my growing up. And then the other part of it was I went to Ranafast and to, uh, to Glenvar for my Irish language immersion each summer for four years for when I was a teenager. Uh, and um, they had a little book there called Aber Auran, which was the blue book of Irish, uh, Irish song for, for youngsters. And, you know, it was there I learned the song that, that uh, Marie's father, Marie's father uh, had written. You know, Glanting Glasgow door. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then I realized, oh, Glanting Glasgow door, he didn't write that melody. That's a really <laughs> old one. And every version of that melody is about leaving Ireland. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's my background. And since I've lived in the States, um, I basically um, started going to Irish sessions and, you know, realizing I'm the only singer here. I and mean, it's like very odd to me that. Uh, there's not more focus on the singing. And, uh, you know, so I would like sing the songs that I had learned that I'd heard from Altan or Planksty or, uh, you know, the Dubliners or, you know, people like the Clancy Brothers and Tommy Makem, who were all, you know, very much part of the soundtrack of my growing up. So it just was a natural thing for me to extend from that. Great, thank you. It's really great to hear all your backgrounds and, and your influences. And uh, in order to set the stage for our workshops today, let's talk briefly about the songs found in Ulster. So first of all, uh, for our audience members who may not know, uh, if someone could say where exactly Ulster is and, and also what distinguishes the songs from this region of Ireland in content and in style. Well, one of the things I think is unique about Ulster is the merging of um, all the influences from the British Isles. Uh, you have the melodic and uh, like poetic influences of songs from the Irish language. And then you have, uh, especially in the north of Ireland, you have a huge influence from Scottish song and from English song. So it's kind of thistle, rose and shamrock all together in one region. Um, the, 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 a lot of songs that, uh, you know, come to the north of Ireland and you'll certainly find them in Sam Henry's Songs of the People are songs that have uh, a lot of Scottish roots. And, uh, you know, the, the, the native songs um, are, are, are often translated into English as well, or sometimes there'll be a song that is halfway between. So you'll have songs <laughs> that, you know, 
we'll have a verse in English and a verse in Irish or vice versa, depending on how the singer chooses to put them together. Uh, you know, so mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's my take on it. Dahi, I'm sure, can add plenty of information on top of that. Well, no, that's 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 uh, definitely true. I feel the same thing that there's a kind of rich soup of the best of those things, just exactly as you you painted them. Um, and I th think that and the, the the type of songs that you find everywhere around uh, Ireland and Britain are obviously in the north, you know. Uh, so you have the you have the just the love songs and the child ballads, what we call the child ballads and the broadside ballads. And then you have ones that are found in other places, but seem more conspicuous in the north, like the hedge schoolmaster songs, uh, what we call are referred to as the as the hedge schoolmaster songs are particularly prominent in the north, you know, and those were songs that um, that kind of use this learned language, you know, so that can sometimes be over the top and sometimes it's just sincere. And they're kind of using the meters of the Irish language songs in English. Um, so I think that those any of the if you hear any of the great singers that we would uh, either have known or listened to the recordings, you notice that like Patty Tunney, for example, his repertoire. Um, and then another one, it was funny, I was thinking, you know, trying what is d actually different. Uh, and it was I was thinking about this Susquehanna for some time before I realized the obvious thing, which is the orange songs. I mean, you would have had orange songs throughout Ireland, but they're definitely very strong and predominant in the north. And for the benefit of people who might know the scene in Ireland, the Orange Order is um, a Protestant uh, organization to bolster and support the descendants of the settlers in Ireland, you know, who came over from Britain. And I like again, the way you say not, that. <laughs> yeah, the North, yeah. <laughs> the North, the North got very heavily planted. Uh, as we call it, by these settlers, the t land was taken away and given to the people from uh, Britain in the hope that they would over totally get rid of all that, the nationalist mm -hmm. Catholic thing. That didn't happen, but that that's partly explains that uh, richness. So, so funny <clears throat> enough, some of the and people who, who weren't orange, who were from the Catholic side, uh, we loved some of those orange songs and sang them. And some of them are very, very beautiful, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as well as funny. If you're from the others, anyhow, who's so, uh, What about you, Mariah? And in, in, in saying that, I think one of the big distinctive things that I notice about the Ulster singing tradition is when you go uh, compare it to the the male voice is always high. It's it's compared to the rest of Ireland. I, I always felt that the male singers had this very high um, uh, in they they sat they didn't sing low they, they sang nearly soprano nearly alto or some whatever you call it i don't know all the technical names of these things but then when you go to appalachia the same thing happens <laughs> where you have that high uh beautiful sweet male voice happening and uh, it's one of the things i always noticed when i listening to the appalachian singers there they use that high uh high in um just my get uh you know that they're just uh they sing in that lonesome high voice and um that doesn't really happen in the rest of ireland and i think there was a big connection there with, with the ulster plantation as i was saying where people actually immigrated to the appalachian uh, mountains and that's where our connection with those uh with america happens where you have all these beautiful songs that are in common with all of us and uh, one, of, one of the biggest ones would have been Barbara Allen that we actually recorded ourselves with that great singer Dolly Parton who um, when my father heard her version he said it's really funny I said I'll send you the words he says don't bother he says I know the words your granny sang the exact same version you know so there was that huge connection with you know it's it, it makes the world smaller and you know it's it's sometimes it's very unique but it's very close as well you know yeah that's wonderful so we we've titled this residency today lamentations and laughter and uh i know um Mairead, uh probably came up with that title or just the idea behind it 
So I'm wondering if uh, either you, Marie, could speak or anyone could speak about um, just this combination of, of these kind of tragic, sad songs and um, the comic songs found in that region. Well, there is a quote, isn't there? Uh, all our all our wars wars were sad, uh, or all our wars were happy, was it? <laughs> Mary, was, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Our, all our wars were merry. We have this kind of a, a opposite thing where the more oppressed we were, the more we expressed ourselves, and I think that happened in Ulster more than anywhere else because we had to have our own identity. Uh, the Ulster plantation was the most successful one, and that's why there, there's there there still is a remnant of the troubles still here, and uh, you know I think it just brings out expression in people to to be sure that their identity will not be lost, you know, and it's happened as well when uh, Elizabeth the first came in and decided to get rid of all the harpers and the poets because they all kind of sided with the people and with uh, and uh, they were kind of banished they tried to banish all the harpers and hang the harpers and, yeah <laughs> hang the harpers and uh, she was really determined to get rid of all of uh, the harpers because they they had a huge influence on the people and ancient ireland it still is in ireland where there's a lot of respect for the artist and the poet and the musician where you know they dined at the king's table you know they dined with their their chieftains you know and that's where that came about the opposite yeah, and i mean i'll speak a little bit to the comic side of it um mm -hmm. one of the things that that you know that i have kind of come to specialize in a little bit is is singing comic songs uh, although I'm perfectly happy to sing a Shan No song that'll break your heart, you know, but yeah. um, the, 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 you know, people need entertainment and, you know, somebody can stand up and tell a funny story. That's always very welcome at any social gathering. And uh, if you can stand up and sing, sing a funny story, that's even more welcome. So, um, you know, and, and, and the themes in these kinds of things, because it's a, uh, a mostly an agricultural, uh, you know, community in in most of Ireland, uh, and certainly in the past, it was an agricultural community. Um, a lot of the songs that that uh, make it into the the repertoire are songs about <laughs> our interactions with our livestock. You know, like you know, <laughs> you know, Ned Flaherty's Drake, and uh, you know, the, the one that I sing a lot is a a song from McGilligan. Uh, um, my bonnie brown hen, things like that. So, so people would 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 make these songs up about you know their neighbors' uh, animals and the weird interactions they might have with them, <laughs> and you know uh, just characters who did weird and wonderful things got immortalized in song. So, you know, it's uh, it's just part of uh, you know common um, you know interest to have funny songs to entertain people, uh, and and since you know. Um, historically, it was an expensive thing to own an instrument. So there was a big focus on <laughs> sung uh, music. So, you know, that would have been the major, the major tradition in my growing up was certainly just communal singing. Yeah, so um, we could find Irish music sessions all around the world. And I'm curious, and maybe I'll ask Dahi to tackle this one to start with. Why do you think that Irish music is so popular all around the world? I think it's because it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> no, the comment, the comment I make about that, uh, you know, is that the contrast, like if you take America, you know, the United States or North America, um, you know, you have your music is all over the world um and uh, and all the different sorts of music that you know the united states has produced i think the great glory of uh, north america its contribution to the world is music and all the different genres all the jazz and blues and rock and now rap and everything that incredible creativity but um if you contrast that with our like the um, uh, united states is a huge colonial power to speak about colonies again it's a dominant imperial power in the world so you have that prestige to carry your music 
So I'm sort of I I don't think of the word proud as a as a positive thing. It's we we regard it as an evil in Ireland, the first deadly <laughs> sin, as it were. But I'm a little bit proud that our music is all over the world because we didn't have that. You know, if anybody, if people in Japan, as they are playing Irish music, or Korea, or wherever, you know, Sweden, all over the world, people are playing Irish music and singing Irish songs. It's because of the the something in it that is particularly rich you know, and beautiful. And, you know, you could theorize, if you accept that that's true, then you could theorize as to, to why it's so rich and beautiful, which is something that, you know, you can can give very good reasons for it, why it is, you know, partly say that what Mairead was saying, that in Ireland, um, you know, poetry and song were really, really, really uh, worked on at all levels of society, you know, like, uh, in medieval and before medieval and then when the gaelic order was destroyed and they weren't didn't have all those upper classes and the you know the schools that we had for hundreds and hundreds of years to teach these things they were all gone and the the, the ordinary people weren't able to rise in the world there was no way for brilliant artistic people to go anywhere they were stuck among the ordinary people and also the the ordinary people in ireland were deprived of all material wealth so the only things that you could work at were the things that didn't require anything material any gadgets or trappings and that is really words and song and poetry and that's how i uh, that's my little package of train of thought on that there and that's what people in ireland still love they still the best thing in the world is to get together with the friends and talk and listen to each other and sing that's the center of everything you know how about that for a theory? <laughs> I think that's <laughs> <We're> perfect. <made. laughs> yeah. We are talkers. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we listen, but no. <laughs> I know. I'm curious if uh, music from Ulster, is it threatened? Is it, is it uh, if there have been efforts made to preserve the music or is it just really going strong at this point? Well, I live here, so it's the strongest <laughs> I've ever seen the music. I've never seen so many young people playing, singing. Um, when we all thought with the re revival, the great revival of Irish traditional music in the 60s and 70s, we all thought, oh, everyone's going to sound the same. But what's really happened is people have, the young ones have really focused in on local styles or particular styles or certain songs and you know it, it's so important and the song is very revered you know you can play I was at a session last night in the middle of the mountains here in Donegal and we were playing tunes but as soon as someone was asked to sing there wasn't you, you couldn't hear a pin drop everyone in the in the place was quiet and had such reverence for songs and the singer and praise in the middle of singing they would say my who you know good on you you know can you gal you know my who hain you know this this kind of egging you on while you're singing and uh, it it really lifts people uh, it doesn't matter if it's in gaelic or in english people revere the singer they revere the voice they listen and then back to merriment again, you know. So yeah, that's, that's one thing that uh, that I really appreciated, like singing in in pubs in Ireland. Because when I sing here in 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 bars in the states, it's like I have to really push my voice to be heard because there's like you know chit chat going on all the time. And uh, but in in Ireland, you know, they'll say singer in the house, and everybody will shut up. Mm -hmm. Because there's that much respect for the bravery that somebody needs to have to stand up there and sing on adorned. You know, you're standing mm -hmm. out there naked in many ways. Mm -hmm. And what you do with your voice then is is what they want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And right. it's particularly oh, true of the unaccompanied singer, you know, like yeah. the fact that you're unaccompanied, you they're even more attentive, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. respectful. Yeah. Yeah. So for the rest of the day, each of you will be offering a workshop that builds on your expertise and your own passions and interests. So I'd like each of you uh, to offer one song <clears throat> as an example of the focus of your workshop 
and then share a little bit about the workshop um, and what participants can expect. So just go at your own order, <laughs> however you'd like. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll start the ball rolling. <laughs> um, I mean, I was thinking of, of, uh, of singing uh, my, uh, my, my Bonnie Brown hand there. Um, and then Dahi mentioned the orange song, so I couldn't help but think of the oil orange flute uh, as uh, an example of one of those orange songs that has become beloved both sides of the of the sectarian divide. So I think I'll do that and we'll 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 throw the uh, Bonnie Brown hen into my comic song set on its own. In the county Toronto, near the town of Dungannon, where many's a ruction myself had a hand in. Bob Williamson lived there, a weaver by trade. And we all of us thought him a stout orange blade. On the 12th of July, as it yearly would come, Bob played with his flute to the sound of the drum. You may talk of your harp, your piano, or lute. There's none can compare with the owl orange flute. But Bob, the deceiver, he took us all in and married a papist called Bridget McGinn, turned papish himself and forsook the old cause that give us our freedom, religion, and laws. Now the boys of the place made some comment upon it, and Bob had to flee to the province of Connacht. He fled with his wife and his fixings to boot, and along with the latter, his owl orange flute. At the <laughs> chapel on Sundays to atone for past deeds, he said, Pathers and Abbeys and counted his beads. Till after a while at the priest's own desire, he went with his flute for to play in the choir. He went with his flute for to play for the mass, but the instrument shivered inside, oh, alas, and blow the way wood, and it made a great noise. The owl flute would play only the Protestant boys. Bob <laughs> jumped and he started and got in a flutter. He threw the owl flute in the blessed holy water. He thought that this charm would bring some other sound. When he tried it again, it played crappies lie down. For all he would whistle and finger and blow. To play pipish music, he found it no go. Kick the Pope and boin water, it freely would sound. But one pipish squeak in it couldn't be found. At the council of priests that was called the next day, they decided to banish the owl flute away. They couldn't knock heresy out of its head. So they bought Bob a new one to play in its stead. Now the owl flute was doomed and its fate was pathetic. It was fastened and burnt at the stake as heretic. As the flames rose around it, you could hear this great noise. The old flute still playing the Protestant boys. <laughs> Lovely. <clears throat> Go on, die. All right. Well, I'll um. <laughs> so I'll sing a song that I, I learned as a teenager from the, this guy Sean O'Haley from Derry, and it's a good it's a, a good example of a type of song. Um, it's a, a song about Henry Joy McCracken, who was um, executed as uh, after the 1798 rebellion in Ireland, uh, which was very uh, ended very horrifically and tragically and so on. But there's a lot of history in the background of this song and this man. Uh, but I'll just sing the song uh, and uh, you can get some of the feeling about it. I really so in, in terms of, you know, what I'll be doing in the workshop. Um, you know, I'll be talk, talking a bit about, um, you know, unaccompanied singing as opposed to accompanying and what happens when you accompany things um, on the guitar. Um, so, the, and, and in fact, this song, when I first heard this song without any guitar, I thought it was beautiful. And the words are particularly distinctive. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a kind of political tragedy song. But there's something very personal and distinctive about the words of it. But anyhow, when I heard the melody, I just thought, 
you know, there's something very unusual about the way that melody sits, you know, and when I started trying the guitar, I thought that's really intriguing. Um, anyhow, so see, can you hear some of that? Man, I am proud to be from the Antrim glens I come, and though I have laboured by the sea, I have followed fife and drum. I have heard the martial tramp of men, I've seen them fight. It's well I remember when we followed Henry Joy. I pulled my boat in from the sea and I hid my sails away. I hung my nets upon a tree and I scanned the moonlit bay. The boys were out their red coats too. I bade my wife goodbye. And there in the shade of the green wood glade, I followed Henry Joy. Alas for Ireland's cause, we fought for home and sire. Though our arms were few, our hearts be true, and five to one lay dead. And many's the lass he missed her lad, and mother mourned her boy. For youth was strong in the dashing throng that followed him. In Belfast town they have built a tree and the red coats mustered there. And I watched him come as the roll of the drum sounded on the buried square. He kissed his sister and went aloft, then waved. The last goodbye, and as he died, I turned and I cried, They have murdered Henry Joy. Lovely, gorgeous. That's that's you. You give it a new cloak, the height when with the accompaniment. You you know you bring out the harmony. It's so lovely. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's a beautiful melody. It is a lovely melody. It must be very old. It I must think be so. Old. Yeah. It's... And then the word, as I say, the word. That thing about the second verse, but pulling the boat in from the sea yeah. and hiding the sea. Away. I mean, there's a lot of types of verses that you find in these broadside ballads, but that's something very distinct and personal yeah. you know it's a very nice poetic way of telling you what the profession and position of the person uh who's yeah. the narrator is and then the yeah. empathy you know like i mean i usually don't i don't glorify violence ever yeah. and if i sing one that has it it's empathy you know of the sadness yeah. of this and cheerfully yeah. going off killed, get yeah. killed. <laughs> Okay, well then I better sing my my little one. Well, like the songs that I sing mostly are love songs, and I suppose in the Gaelic language, eighty percent or ninety percent of the songs are always love, and unrequited love at that. Not many are are written from a woman's perspective, and that's because the poets were always a uh, professional and, you know, they it I suppose stems from that. But um, this song. 
I, I love it because of the poetry and uh, the melody. And I got it from a neighbour called Annie Onyemun, Annie Nigalahar. And uh, it's called Molly Crotley. And uh, I started singing it again recently because there's a verse in it or a line in it that says, Gazorebshi Mohedfi Hunshatan. Her, I, I loved her so much that all my senses were blown into oblivion <laughs> with love. Rebshi Mohedfi Hunshatan. I just love the, it's so unique and uh, obviously unrequited love. So I'll just try and sing that. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much Thank from you. the three of you. That's fantastic. So that concludes our first session. Um, thank you so much uh, to Dahi, Seamus, and Maraid for participating in that really inter interesting introductory session. And uh, our next one begins at 11 o'clock. It's called Tragic Little Songs. And Maraid will be leading that one. It is on a different URL. It's don't stay in this Zoom because you won't find it here. Um, if you don't know how to find it, uh, check out our website, susquehannafolk.org, where you'll see the whole schedule for today. Uh, so with that, we'll say our goodbyes. And hopefully we'll see you all at future workshops throughout the day. So, so long now. Yeah.